Happy Palm Sunday. Mm. Wasn't that awesome? Oh, love it. Thank you, band. And thank you for that surprising tribute right in the middle of the second song. You got me. I did not see that coming. And I usually can sense out a little thing like that. So thank you, guys. I can't believe it's already been two full years since I've been pastor. Um, And it is awesome. And I thank you guys for your love and your support on behalf of my family. Uh, We love it. We are quite happy to retire here, die here, or get raptured here. Because that is what... I am, just, I am just excited. I am so jazzed, not only because it's Palm Sunday, but did you all notice we had a guest guitarist today? Anybody notice that? Mr. Dave Coover, yes, seated next to his lovely wife. You may know them. You might recognize her from teaching Refit here, and Dave's been, they were here yesterday helping all the time and just doing great stuff. What you may not know is that last Sunday we went to lunch with them, and they have joined our church and have united with our body, so Welcome. I promised I wouldn't make a big deal out of it, and I wouldn't embarrass him or single him out in any way, but they're right there. So uh, welcome, guys. Good to have you, and I am so fired up about Palm Sunday. Yesterday, by the way, woo-hoo-hoo, if I look a little pinkish on the scalp, because we had our big, big annual outreach, and it was phenomenal. I tell you what, uh, we added some hours to it and, and made it a little longer, spread it out more so we could accommodate the crowds, and we estimate so many of our community came by, 125 people per hour walked through those fields. And that's so over 400 people, and it was phenomenal. Some guests may have returned today. So I want to give you a little heads up. We're not always weird, but today we're going to be a little weird, okay? So just giving you a little heads up. I would say 51 out of 52 Sundays a year, I always leave with like a challenge and an invitation, and we sing a song, and I send you out with the music playing, and man, you're ready to go take on the world, and we are fired up, and we are going crazy. Some stay for 30 minutes and 45 minutes and an hour afterwards hugging, and it's awesome. Most days, right? I love it. It's a healthy thing. It's great. But today, we're not going to do that. Today, we're actually going to not have an invitation or a challenge, per se. I'm going to take us all the way through Palm Sunday, all the way through Good Friday. We're going to leave remembering the cross, okay? What we're going to do is we start Holy Week. As we start Passion Week, I'm going to walk us through in about 25 minutes, (laughs) all the way through from Sunday, Palm Sunday, through Wednesday, through remembering the Lord's Supper, which, by the way, this Wednesday night, we'll be taking the Lord's Supper all the way through Good Friday. And we're going to leave today in silence. We're going to leave almost like a holy hush, okay? So this is going to be one of those rare Sundays where we let the moment linger, okay? Because we're going to be focusing on the cross. So you're welcome to linger outside and hug and talk, man, isn't God great? Wasn't that moving or powerful? Whatever God spoke to you. But in here, for those who want to linger a few minutes at the cross and just remember what he did for us, we're going to protect this as a sanctuary of silence. Okay, everybody with me on that? Okay, and you'll know when because I'll stand us and it'll be real clear that we're about to wrap up, okay? So today, if you're visiting with us, please don't freak out. We're not always this weird, but today we are, okay? And if you are ready, I am so excited to, uh, to dive into Palm Sunday. As I was looking at this, I, I, of course, I do my homework and I, I Google just to see what the culture says about Palm Sunday because that's where you get all your spiritual nourishment is from Google. And as I, as I Googled this, I realized some people just don't quite grasp what this day is all about. Like this pastor right here at this church who says, at our island, every Sunday is Palm Sunday. Woohoo! Well, that's not quite what Palm Sunday's about. Or maybe this guy right here, I love this one, came up. He said, oh, I thought it was Palm Palm Sunday. And you can just see <laughs> this poor soul, he just doesn't get it. We haven't changed the name. It's not Palm Palm Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. There's a huge difference. But when Jesus shows up, he changes everything. He even changes people's names. Y'all remember this great one, one of the greatest disciples? Here's your order, sir. A thousand business cards saying, Simon the fisherman. Later that day, Jesus shows up. Simon, from now on, you shall be known as Peter. And just look at his face. How it felt. I just had a thousand cards made. Are you kidding me? When Jesus shows up, he changes things. He changes everything. And that's what happened 2,000 years ago on Palm Sunday when he rode into town on a bizarre little donkey's colt. And people are like, what is this? What is going on? Let's find out. Let's look at the scripture. Turn with me to John chapter 12. We're going to read verses 12 through 15. And while you pull that up, let me welcome those who are joining us online today. God bless you. It's good to have you streaming with us as well. John 12. Everybody have it? Let's read along together. And it says, the next day, the crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. 
Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, O people of Israel. See, your king is coming. And he's seated on a great war horse. Did you ever say that? He's seated on a donkey's colt. What in the world? We're going to dive into this. Everybody loves a parade, right? Parades are cool. They're fun. Woo, we have a great time. The, the teeming crowds come out, and they're pouring stuff, and they're throwing great confetti, and some go in late into the night, and some are a little crazy down in Louisiana. We don't talk about those because they're kind of sinful, but there's parades going all night long, and, 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 and people are usually excited about them. Parades are great, and while they didn't call this triumphal entry a parade, that's exactly what it was. We, we go back and we can look at the earliest modern parade that we had pictures of is this one right here from 1927, where Charles Lindbergh had uh, gone across the Atlantic, he had safely come back, and man, people were excited. They say 750,000 tons of ticker tape rained down on New York. Now, youngins, if you don't know what ticker tape is, just think confetti, okay? Not graffiti, confetti. And that's kind of what, what fell down. But that parade was dwarfed in the 60s when we saw what happened with this man who circled the earth three times safely. And here's a photo of that actual day where he's coming down the streets of New York. And they say this was 3,474 tons of confetti. And they partied all day. Seven miles of that was covered in confetti. It was incredible. It was one of the great things. That was the atmosphere that day in Palm Sunday. As you go back 2,000 years and you look and see what happened in Jerusalem, they didn't call it a parade, but that's what Palm Sunday kicked off. It was this huge, huge deal. Remember, Passover is one of the biggest deals in the Jewish festivals. It's massive. This Passover was gargantuan. Something was different. The city had swelled, and people had been hearing about this Jesus. He'd been going around healing people and doing good, and, it's, and people just flocking to him. For three years, he'd been saying, something's coming. Something's coming. They're like, yeah, you're going to be our king, man. We're going to put you up on a horse, and you're going to ride in. You're going to overthrow those wascally womans, and you're going to get rid of all these people that are oppressing us and keeping them under our thumbs. And that wasn't quite what Jesus had in mind, not this time. So he comes riding into town, and everything's different. Jesus knows it. You can feel it. The disciples know something's up. You can, the air was crackling with excitement. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been to an event where you're just like, Man, it's so like a striper concert. You're just so excited, and you just know that something great's about to happen. Word had spread, and the expectations for this were sky high. You know I love to point out hidden gems when you're reading scriptures, especially if it's something you've read a hundred times. And you're like, oh, yeah, I got this. I can, I can say it in my sleep. There is hidden, odd, beautiful, peculiar things in God's scripture. If you open your heart and say, Lord, teach me some things. Show me stuff. Am I missing something? Am I glossing over something because I just yawn? Because I've read it a hundred times. I've heard the Passover story. I've heard Palm Sunday. We know about Easter. Do we? Do we really give God a chance to speak to us? Because something really interesting is going on here. Almost everything we know about Jesus is found in one of the four Gospels. Whether it's in Matthew or Mark or maybe Luke or John. Almost everything we know comes from that. When a gospel has an event mentioned two times, whether it's Mark or Luke or John and Matthew, when, when it's mentioned in two different gospels, it's a pretty big deal. When it's mentioned in three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know it's huge. It's a big deal. Today, this event is one of the few ones that is mentioned in all four gospels. So that's a peculiar point to me. One of the things we know, when an event is mentioned in all four Gospels, it's important. The alarm should be going off. Don't miss this. There's something, there's a reason that this is extremely important for God wanting us to know this. The procession began as Jesus crested this hill. He's up on the Mount of Olives, and he's looking down into the capital city. He's looking down in Jerusalem, about 200 feet up, and he's winding his way through all these olive groves. Okay, it literally snakes through these, these olive groves. He goes past Olive Garden, past Carabas, and he's heading down into the city. Just making sure you're awake. And he's heading down, and he sees the eastern gate. And he comes through the city. But something really strange is happening here, which brings us to peculiar point number two. What seems insignificant at first is actually quite profound. Don't miss this. God is showing us something. I want to paint a picture here of how bizarre what's about to happen is. Jesus has two of his good men go into town and get a borrow, like borrow a donkey. Not any donkey, an unbroken, untamed, probably never ridden before donkey. Not a big, strong, a little guy, 
just a little colt. And he says, I want you to go get it, and I want you to bring it back to me. And if somebody were to happen to stop you and go, what you doing? That's my donkey. All you're supposed to say to him is, don't worry, the master needs it, and it'll be fine. Y'all, if you don't see how strange this is, bring it into modern day times. Let's say I come up to you, I say, I need two volunteers, anybody? I want you to go down to Walmart, okay? And in the third stall before the handicap parking, you're going to see an unridden Harley Davidson. And the keys are going to be in it. And I want you to go, don't ask, just, just get on that bad boy, fire it up, and I want you to ride it back here, okay? I'm going to ride that. Oh, and if a team of hell's angels comes rolling out of Walmart, chasing you with their big leather vest and their tattoos and their whatever they carry, and they come, hey, what are you doing with that Harley Davidson? No problem. All you got to do is look at it and go, it's okay. The master needs it, and just drive it away, okay? It'll be easy. Who's with me? Anybody want that? Two people? You lie? You wouldn't do that? This, that's how crazy this is. You go get the, only the Harley Davidson would be like my old Honda scooter. It'd be like, me, <laughs> weep, beep, 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 right? It wouldn't even be a cool Harley. Jesus doesn't pick a war horse. Why not? Why does he pick a lowly donkey? Why not a horse-drawn carriage? Why not just keep walking? He'd made it this far. I mean, he's like from here to Diane, from the city. Why don't he just keep walking? There's a reason. Something peculiar is happening here. And the disciples, those closest to him, didn't even get it. This next verse reveals that. John 12, 16 says this. His disciples didn't understand at the time what he was doing was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, years later, he goes, they remember these scriptures that had come true right before their eyes, and they missed it. It was so peculiar to them. It was so bizarre. This was a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9, hundreds of years written before. And it happened right before them, and they missed it. Their eyes weren't open for that peculiar, that, that nugget that Jesus was fulfilling right in front of them. So they come into town, and they're going down the road, and they start laying down their coats and getting palm branches and laying it down. And they cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, whoo, blessed is you. We just sang it. Beautiful. Hosanna, love it. Great song. What in the world does it mean? Comes from the Jewish word, Hosanna. Hosanna simply literally means he who saves, or better yet, save us now, Lord. We need help. It would be the modern day cry of help me, help us, help us King Jesus. See what they're saying? They're ready for him, to make him king by force if necessary. Jesus has other plans. Although I'll give you a hint, the next time he comes back, it's not like this. It's not like this, right? You can bow now or you can bow later, okay? A little, little heads up, just a little friendly tip. As he comes in, they're, right, they're, they're crying out, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But I want to point out something else peculiar. Check out this next verse written in Luke chapter 19. And I want you to notice, we recognize this top part. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Woo, Hosanna. And then it says, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Does that sound vaguely familiar? How eerie. How divinely fitting is it that the words we see there were the exact same words the angels said at his birth. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. It's almost identical. The verse that he says, the angels at the birth of him, his first week, echo what is being said on his final week. Y'all, that is wild. That's peculiar. Point number three is this. Even at the manger, the shadow of the cross fell over it. From the beginning, this was no accident. God knew what was coming, and he still willingly went through with it. How astounding. Lord, what is this love you have for your people? So we have this 2,000 years ago crowd, and the crowd's getting huge, and we think we know what big crowds are, and we don't. So I'm going to put it in modern-day terms. Like The closest we can think of is like Times Square, New Year's Eve, right? Anybody ever been there for that? Anybody? Oh, good. We got smart people. One person not smart. Okay, that's okay, Roy. We, we forgive you on that. I would never go there because I don't like crowds except for on church time. That's it. Everything, I, crowds annoy me. I don't, don't touch me, right? We get annoyed going to Peak Fest. You, you, you're in my space. What are you doing? Right? You, you want to come at me? You want to come at me? Right. And you get, don't act like it's just me. Somebody's in your space and they're crowding you, right? You kind of don't. Here's, here's a modern day illustration. I'm going to pick a sleepy town. 
Southeast Alabama. Oh. Not Southwest Alabama, Southeast Alabama. This is a city, I don't even like to say its name, but you need to know it for the illustration. This is the town of Auburn. Can anything good come from Auburn? Just, just like Nazareth, right? In this town, on a given day, the population is usually 58, 59,000 people, typically. 364 days a year, in this sleepy little town, you would expect to run into 58 to 60,000 people. 364 days a year. But on one day a year, something happens. God's glorious team shows up from across the state, known as Alabama Roll Tide, God bless America, and they come into town and something happens. Ryan, can we zoom in on this stadium right here? Want to zoom in? Okay, this is, oh, it's Auburn Stadium. Just forgive that, okay? As you see this, this crowd triples in 24 hours to 150,000 people for one day only. This is like what happened at Passover. Suddenly, people had come in, millions. Josephus, the great Jewish historian, said it was estimated that Jerusalem swelled to six to ten times its normal size when Jesus rode that donkey. That's how crazy it was. People were, I mean, can you imagine the logistics? The, the feeding of these people? Where do you sleep? What do you do with, what do you do with sewage? They didn't have porta potties. What, what do you think of the logistics? This is just a small, we, get, we don't understand Passover. We don't understand, we get football, right? We understand this. Think of the crowds. It was crazy crowded in Passover. And as we're having this carnival-like atmosphere, there's people jamming into the streets. And then the whispers start. The roads are packed, and they're looking towards the east gate, and the whisper starts to spread through the crowd. He's coming. He's almost here. Jesus, remember the Nazarene, the guy who healed Lazarus? Remember the Bartimaeus, the blind guy, and all these people? He's here. What? He's here. He's coming, and he's just around the corner. And they, and they start coming, and man, people are starting to look, and they're like, you know, what, what's it going to be? Is it going to have an entourage? It's going to have a war horse? It's going to be this awesome thing? Because I, I wonder who was in the crowd that day, and what did they think? Because it wasn't all great, happy people happy to see them. The first people that you know were in that crowd were the scoffers, those who mocked Jesus, those who didn't get him, those who, quite frankly, would rather him not even show up, specifically the Roman soldiers. See, Roman soldiers, they were, they were given the task that day, you better not let this crowd get out of hand. There is a rebel coming. In fact, some are calling him an insurrection king, a king of the Jews or something silly like that. And buddy, if you value your job, you and your legion, you better keep the peace. It's hard enough keeping these weird Jewish people under control. This is how they think, right? They, they, they butted heads. The Jews did not like Roman occupation, and I don't blame them. So they're saying, you know, the crowd's getting a little out of control. Ask a security guard how he feels when he starts seeing the crowd get a little bit bigger than he's equipped to handle. They get antsy. And you just know, when the whispers came to those soldiers, that Jesus guy's coming. Did they reach for their sword a little bit tighter? They kind of have their hand on the hilt ready. They kind of make themselves, they bow up like guys do to make sure they know that I'm here and I'm watching you. Watching you. What happened? And then it happened. He crested the corner and they see him on a donkey? And you know, you know, they smirked. You know they giggled. It had to, it had to scoff. That's not what they're expecting. They're expecting a king. Roman kings don't ride little donkeys. You know what they're expecting? They're expecting a triumphal entry. That's what they've been hearing. It's coming, man. They're ready. They're, they're jacked up, man. I got the battle frenzy. And all of a sudden, oh, never mind. He's on a poodle. What is this? And he comes up. And they say, that is not a kingly entry. What guy would debase himself. This is a joke. This is embarrassing because their, their triumphal entry, when their Roman generals win a battle, they get to come home with all of their trophies displayed on their chariots. And if they conquered more than 5,000 people, they got to ride in a golden chariot pulled by white stallions through the streets of Rome with people showering them with flowers and gifts. And to make it even more of a spectacle, they would chain all of their captives that they had conquered, all their leaders, behind the chariot and force them to walk through the streets, getting pelted by tomatoes and all kinds of things. But that wasn't it. They would drive that chariot all the way. It wouldn't even stop. They would take them to the arena. 
They would unchain their captors, and they would watch them fight to the death, sometimes against wild beasts. Oh, that's heroic. That is a mighty, mighty warlike, kingly entry. Not this. What king would ride a lowly donkey? So they're scoffing. Compared to a Roman triumph, the Lord's entry to Jerusalem was extremely humble. And isn't that just like Jesus? Isn't that the point? Our awesome Savior is so humble, even though he didn't need to be, even though he didn't have to be. They probably scoffed at him. If this was their Messiah, as far as they are concerned, they could have him. And they scoffed. Isn't that some, some uh, the way our colleagues and our coworkers treat Jesus today? They scoff. <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing? They scoff at those who still worship him. You mean to tell me you get up on your Sunday and you join with other simpletons? <laughs> You've heard the insults. You, you, you followers of Jesus, you're so narrow-minded. You're so, bless your hearts, you're so anti-science. You're so anti-progress. You just, we just need to pray for those little Christian peoples. Do, 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 look, pet them, they're so cute. But they're so ignorant. You, you've heard the insult, people scoff. You've heard it, it's okay. It's nothing new. Who in their right mind would believe a man could raise the dead? Who in their right mind believes that he could take a few loaves and a few fish and feed 5,000 people? Who in their right mind honestly believes someone's going to give sight to someone who is blind? Who believes these things? (laughs) I do. And I bet I'm not the only one here today who believes this. I believe every single word of this. It was true, but we come across people who scoff. But then that's not the only people in the crowd. There were those who were there to see the spectacle. I call them the the tire kickers or the the spectacle seekers, like got their popcorn and they're ready to see like Cirque du Soleil, like, woo, come on, impress me. See, there's verses here that reveal the heart of people like that. John 12, 9 says, meanwhile, the large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came. Here it is. But not because of Jesus, but because they wanted to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Then it goes on to say in verse 17, 18, many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they heard this miraculous sign had happened. So they showed up seeing the spectacle. Remember, this guy was dead. You remember the story. Mary's there, Martha's there. Oh, you could have come. If you'd come a few days earlier, he wouldn't have been dead. And Jesus starts to cry, and it's, it's, a, it's a horrible moment for everybody. And Jesus says, take away the stone. I'm like, what? Take away the stone. No, 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 no. Jesus, you don't understand. He's been dead for four days now. And let's be honest. There's a stench. Rotting flesh smells awful. We can't take away the stone. You missed your chance, Jesus. Jesus says, roll away the stone. And he calls out, Lazarus, come forth. You know what happened? He came forth, still in his mummy clothes, still wrapped in his grave clothes. They had to unwind him. They had seen this, and the miracle had spread. And now the rest of Jerusalem, who wasn't there, wants to see it. The spectacle seekers, and they're showing up because they're freaking out. Hey, have you ever seen a dead man? What does a resurrected man look like? I mean, have you seen one? Is he gray? I mean, be honest. Is is he a little weird looking? Is he had like one eye kind of going over here all of a sudden? I mean, is, is he washed out? Can you tell? If he's standing next to a normal guy who hadn't died and come back, what does he look like? Is he, is he, is, is, does he walk like this because he can't really help it? He's half dead. You know what? You know they were curious, and you would be too. They were coming to see the spectacle, and they wanted to see what was happening. And you know, there was probably kids lining up and moms and dads pushing them forward like, hey, let him heal you or let's do this. And you know, oh, pick me, pick me. He's coming by. Like, pick me, teacher. I'm ready, ready to go. They wanted to see the spectacle. And it wasn't the first time Jesus was getting this kind of stuff. We read in John 6.30. So they began asking him, what miraculous sign will you do to give us so we may see and believe you? What will you do, Jesus? You catch that? What will you do? What will you do for me? What sign will you give for me? What is your razzmatazz? Show me your jazz hands, Jesus. What magic trick are you going to do? And then we'll believe. The spectacle seekers, they, so many people wanted to see the miracles, but they didn't want the master. You know anybody like that today? 
Man, when, oh, when tragedy hits, oh, they're there. Oh, would you pray for me? You know, I've never talked to God. I don't even know him, but I think you might. Can you pray for me? I, I need a Ferrari. I need some help here. It's, it's a rough day. My Lamborghini's in the shop. And we, can you, can you, you see what I'm saying? They, they, they're, not, they're not legit. They're not sincere. They want the miracles, but they don't want anything to do with the miracle giver. And we see that today. But that wasn't the only one in the group that day. My favorites were there. Oh, <laughs> The super saints, my favorite, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. We're all familiar with the Pharisees and their grand hypocrisy and their huge displays of piousness. And we're all familiar with the wealthy aristocratic Sadducees. The Sadducees were the ones who didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. And <laughs> I love that joke, man. It just doesn't get old. I'm going to tell it every year. So you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Ryan, you got a picture of them here? Here's one of them acting like he's happy, but he's not. He's sad. These guys were fine as long as you let them be the life of the party. They were fine as long as you didn't rock the boat. If you let them have the center seats in the synagogue, if you let them have the front row seat at striper concerts, if you let them get the choice seats everywhere they go, if you praised them, if, as long as you didn't rob them of their power and their glory, they were fine with you. But, buddy, you threatened that, and it is on. They couldn't stand it. They would come against you, and you know they knew Jesus was here. And they were not happy, and they were about to rock the boat, and they were going berserk at this. So we had scoffers, we had the spectacle seekers, now we got the super saints, but thankfully there's one last group that was there that day. And these are the good ones. These are the ones I kind of hope you find yourself in this crowd. These are the sincere, the sober-minded, the serious about the Lord. And here is the verse that reveals their heart. John 12, 20, and 21. Now, there were also some Greeks, okay? So not, not even necessarily Jews from the local area. There were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip with a request. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. We just want to see Jesus. You can take your spectacle. You can take all the pomp and circumstance. You can take all this stuff. Can you just introduce us? Can you give us a minute with your master? We want to see Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Oh, that we would all say that. That we would come with sincere hearts into his presence, just seeking him, wanting to just glorify him, to worship him, to kneel at his feet, and to give him honor and glory. What a difference it would make in our lives if that was our heart's cry. If we said, we just want to see Jesus. You could take the show you can take all the fancy stuff. Just give me Jesus. When we recognize the depth of love that God has for us, when we see that he would send Jesus to die for us, we are changed. When we understand that realization that God gave his son to die for you, to die for me, when we were unlovely, totally, so that we would not perish but have everlasting life, y'all, that kind of passion should change us. When we have more passion for Christ, I think we'll understand Christ's passion better. And maybe our passion would flame into this roaring inferno if we truly got it. This is the last week of Jesus' earthly life. We're looking at Passion Week. That's why it's called that, Holy Week. In fact, in just three or four more days, Jesus is going to eat what we would come to call his last supper. We're there. We're at that week. We would later rename it the Lord's Supper, and we take communion, and we remember. In fact, this Wednesday, we're going to do that. We're going to do something very special. We're going to pause our curriculum that we've been in, and we're going to have a worship service where we remember halfway through Passion Week, between Palm Sunday and Good Friday, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. I invite you to be here for that. It is going to be a powerful, special time, Holy Week. It began with this parade like no other. A hero's welcome. They're laying down the palms. Blessed is the king. Here he comes. It's going to be awesome. woo And then within hours, the crowd has turned. And those who are hailing him are now hating him. And it is ugly. And things go from bad to worse. His final night ends with a joke of a trial. It, I mean, it is a complete mockery what happens. But it was by design. And the sentence that comes from that trial is death. And now it's Friday, and the cross stands right there. 
And while we don't like to remember this, we don't want to talk about what happened on that day, hear me. The devil would love nothing more than for us to forget about it. The devil would love nothing more than for churches to gloss over it. If we don't talk about it, then no one will. He would love nothing more than for us to sanitize this. Maybe just gloss over it and say, it was a bad day, kind of dark. He was hurting a little bit. <laughs> but you know what? That's not the Bible. And we won't gloss over it because we do remember. Our love for him and what he went through for us compels us to remember. The crucifixion began with a brutal scourging. I'm talking from a guy who was a well-trained soldier. This was his job. Violently, they grabbed his arms, and they tightly strapped each wrist. And with an evil look, that strong-armed soldier had a whip clenched in his fist. And laced with chips of bone and sharp metal, they beat him hard from his shoulders to his feet. And it sliced right through his olive skin, just like razors through a tight sheet. And countless times his blood splattered as each inhuman lash kept on being given. And several times his knees probably gave way as his flesh just hung like ribbons. But surprisingly, he turned his head. Though the words you know he used were few, that soldier's face had to turn pale when he said to him, all this shed blood is for you. Mockingly, they took a garment and they tossed it across his weakened form. And as his blood pressure began to fall deathly low, the crowds like this began to swarm. And they forced him to carry his cross, his own cross, uphill. As his face, they punched and they smacked. While splinters from this crisscross beam dug deep into his back. And through lack of sleep and dehydration, his tongue began to swell. And then weakened by his loss of blood, we know that this great teacher fell. And when he did, some of his precious blood splattered on a man named Simon's shoe. And as Jesus bent to wipe it off, I can just hear him saying, Simon, my blood is shed for you. And my blood can cleanse the soul. It can heal the sick. It can mend your heart. It can give you access to the very throne of God. It can go the distance through all the pain right to where you are because my blood is shed for you. I am the spotless lamb. They weren't done. They pounded a spike between the bones in his wrist, bursting arteries and veins. And as they dropped the cross in the hole they dug, his body convulsed in pain, in an agony and a torment that never a soul shall find. What does Jesus do? He tilts his face towards heaven with full control of his mind and with more love than any human has heard. Before that time or since, our Lord made a statement that to this day, it makes the strongest skeptic wince. He cried, Father God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as he gave his life for those lost in sin, he was saying, my blood is shed for you. At this point, Jesus had been on the cross for hours. We read in verse 45 that at noon, the light from the sun disappeared and the darkness fell across the land for three hours. Around three o'clock, Jesus calls out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which literally means, my God, my God, wh why have you abandoned? Where have you gone? What happened? What, what happened? Because in that moment, for one second, for one second only, in all of time, the Father took the sins of the world, yours and mine, past, present sins, future sins, and he hurled them onto the blameless sacrifice. And in that one second, the Father turned on the sacrifice to cast all of our filth, all of our nastiness, on the only thing that could take it away. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You remember that. And he hurled it onto the cross. And Jesus gasped, whoa, 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 what just happened? 
for the first time ever, separation between the Father and the Son. There was a cloud, and then it was gone. And Jesus knew what had happened. And then he uttered some incredible, incredible words. And there was one other person who was there, the only one I haven't talked about. Standing right off to the side was a non-believer who was a Roman centurion, a guard. And he was standing there, and he made this bizarre statement. He said, whoa, surely this man was the Son of God. And I stand here today, and I say the same thing. Surely this man is the Son of God. And today, I invite you to stand and declare that with me. Let's stand together now as we conclude this service. I want to run us through the last few seconds of this life where he comes and under a darkened sky, we begin to read the earth begins to shake and the rocks are split apart and the tombs of the dead open up. And it says the bodies of many godly men and women began to come out of the grave and those who had been raised from the dead were now seen by many. We read that there was rumbling and trembling, and the ground begins to heave, slowly growing into a swell, into a roar, a terrifying earthquake, that on this day that would forever be known as Good Friday, Jesus shouts one last time, releasing his spirit and saying, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It is finished to tell us die. And now as you go, may we remember this somber moment, this important crux in history. As you take this with you, we leave today in silence knowing that the hope of Easter is just around the corner. Wednesday night we remember. Sunday is Easter. Today we leave in silence as we remember what he went through. You are dismissed. Go in silence and go in peace. Thank <laughs> you.